partying here tonight, which is, uh, which is a great way to begin. Um, my name is, is Steve Cochran. I have the, the privilege of serving as the superintendent of the, the Princeton Public Schools, and I have the privilege of, um, of welcoming all of you here this evening. It is, um, it's incredibly exciting uh, to have so many people here tonight to talk about restorative justice, justice and to consider uh, what the implementation of restorative justice could mean for, for our schools and for our community. And I have to say, um, it's particularly uh, gratifying to see so many of our students here this evening. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, as with every good thing that happens in this town, uh, this event is the result of many partnerships. Uh, so I, I want to be sure to mention that in addition to the, the Princeton Public Schools, this event is being co-sponsored by the um, Princeton Special Ed PTO, by the Princeton High School PTO, by the John Witherspoon PTO, by the uh, committed and faithful Princetonians, Vern and Larry, where are you? Um, yeah. By Not In Our Town, uh, Princeton, by the Princeton Civil Rights Commission, by the Princeton Youth Advisory Committee, and by the Minority Student Achievement Network. Where is our Minority Student Achievement Network? <laughs> and I want to offer uh, a special thank you to Dr. Julia Sass Rubin, um, who most of us know uh, as, a, as a parent in our district, but she is uh, someone whose commitment to issues of social justice on the national level and his commitment to our students here in Princeton um, really inspired her to invite her colleague, Dr. Ann Gregory, to join um, with us tonight and to talk about this very important issue of, of restorative justice. I'm going to be introducing Julia in a moment, who will introduce Ann, Dr. Gregory, but I want to say just a few words before that. Schools are about learning and teaching. When we teach reading or math, we expect that students will mispronounce or miscalculate. We don't punish them for those behaviors. Instead, we use those mistakes to understand where students may be experiencing difficulties and to encourage real learning. But schools don't just teach reading and math. We also teach students how to be members of a community. Ideally, we teach them how to behave respectfully and caringly in the classroom, in the cafeteria, in the hallways, on the playground, on the buses, on the computer, engaged in social media. But students sometimes make mistakes as a member of a community. They do or say things that are hurtful to others. And when they do, when they make mistakes as members of the community, what is our response as a school system? Schools have two choices. We can say what rule was broken and what are the consequences. Or we can say what harm was caused and how can we heal that harm. The first approach leads to punishment. The second approach leads to learning. The first approach, if it involves suspension, actually separates the student from the very community of which, he, of which he or she is supposed to be learning to be a responsible member. How does that make sense? The second approach, the restorative approach, guides the student in reflecting on what he or she did wrong and hold the student accountable for making it right. I'm reminded of Robert Fulgham's All I Learned in Kindergarten, clean up your mess, say you're sorry, flush. <laughs> <laughs> the second approach actually brings the student closer into community as counselors, teachers, parents, principals, community partners work together to guide that student to reflect on his or her behavior so that it doesn't occur again. 
Most schools in our country use the first approach, the rules and consequences approach. It is an approach that on a national scale leads to high levels of suspension, on average 6% of any K-12 school district. And it is an approach, as Dr. Gregory will explain to us, that disproportionately affects students of color and students with special needs. Here in Princeton, we have begun the shift from the first approach to the second approach. We have nearly 4,000 students in this district. Our suspension rate is less than 1%. In the four years I've been here, it's averaged about 35 students. But restorative justice is not ultimately about reducing numbers. It's about building community. It's about giving our students such a solid sense of, of belonging and connection and caring that when they do make a mistake, and they will because they're kids and they're programmed to push boundaries, that when they do they make those mistakes, they'll feel sorry for what they did and they will try to make it right. I am proud of what we've done in this district to begin the movement from the first approach to the second approach and to try to build that sense of belonging and care. All of our administrators at the high school have been trained in the responsive classroom approach. And today, actually for the first time here at John Witherspoon Middle School, we had um, our first advisory. Um, I don't know if there are teachers here or students here from John Witherspoon in the sixth or seventh grade, but it was a family meeting where for 25 minutes, um, small groups of students gathered in a circle with their teacher. Um, they played a game and then they um, began to talk about what community meant to them, their definition and understanding of community. Tomorrow, that was their practice. Tomorrow will be the first Friday family meeting here at John Witherspoon. They will be meeting in these small groups every Friday from now to the end of the year as a pilot for what they will be doing all next year. Um, it's our first attempt here to really introduce advisory and the circle concept that Anne may talk about tonight um, that builds that strong sense of, of community and connection. Um, and to really lay the foundation for the restorative justice work that we are committed to in this district. I am here tonight to learn. I am not an expert on restorative justice. Uh, as I said, as a district, we are in the process of making transitions. Um, we will continue to make mistakes as we move through that, and we ask for the patience of this community and the support of this community as we do. I'm delighted that there are so many people here tonight, um, students, teachers, staff, community partners, people who truly care about our kids and the schools and about the quality of the community that we have um, and the character of the students that, that graduate into this, this community. So. Um, I thank you all for being here, and I will conclude by um, inviting my good friend, um, Dr. Julia Sass Rubin, uh, to say a few words and to introduce her colleague, Dr. Anne Gregory. This is so exciting to see so many people here. Um, thank you very much, Superintendent Cochran, and I just want to add to the acknowledgement and thanks that you gave in terms of the partnerships, obviously with Princeton Public Schools, first and foremost, but also the special ed PTO actually canceled an event, or postponed an event they were going to hold so that we could have your undivided attention tonight and not have conflicting events. And um, I also want to thank, uh, obviously, Fern and Larry, who have been very, very helpful in this event. Woo! The off yes. <laughs> and to bring all the uh, committed faithful Princetonians with them tonight. Woo! I also want to thank uh, Linda Oppenheim from uh, Not In Our Town, who's been very, very helpful in this. Very welcome to thank you. And I want to thank Amy Wang. Where are you? So Amy has been uh, my partner in planning this event, and she created those beautiful posters. I have no artistic ability whatsoever, and made sure that they were plastered everywhere. So thank you very, very much in helping to make this happen. Um, yeah, So, um, Anne is going to speak, Dr. Gregory, excuse me, is going to speak for about an hour and then take questions. And I have a roaming mic, so I'll run around the room and uh, facilitate that. 
And I'm going to just, I'm going to turn it over to her in two seconds. I just wanted to say uh, one thing, which is you may have seen some breaking news around this topic in the last few weeks. So we had a GAO report that came out very recently, which found yet again a consistent pattern, as Superintendent Cochran mentioned, of disparate impact for um, punitive discipline on, on children of color, particularly children who are black. And I know you're going to talk about that some more. The other thing you may have heard in the news is that Secretary DeVos, the Secretary of Education, is re-examining um, a, a guidance that was issued by the Obama administration in 2014 to discourage suspensions and expulsions and to make districts more cognizant of the disparate impact of such disciplinary um, actions on children of color because they are just outrageously high and kids with special needs. So these have both been in the news of late, and so it's, it's a very timely topic, not just for our district, but for every district. So with that, let me turn to um, my introduction, which I'm so thrilled to have Dr. Gregory here. She's an associate professor in the so school psychology department at Rutgers University, a fine, fine university. Um, her research is focused on the persistent trend of African-American adolescents being issued school suspensions and expulsions at higher rates than adolescents from other groups. And uh, more recently, she has focused on restorative approaches to school discipline, which she's going to obviously speak to us about. She is right now conducting research in seven schools in Brooklyn, and she's closely tracking the rollout of restorative practices in those schools. And next year, because she's not busy enough, she'll start a large-scale study of 18 schools in Brooklyn. I think we have to convince her to do more in New Jersey as well. Um, she's authored 50 peer-reviewed journal articles and numerous book chapters, and she's, her research has been supported by federal agencies and private foundations. She served on the American Psychological Association's Task Force on Resiliency and Strength in Black Children and Adolescents, and consults with the U.S. Department of Justice as a school discipline expert. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Ann Gregory. So much for such a nice introduction. Can you hear me? We'll put the mic there. Yeah. So to project. Okay. So let me get my slides up and running here. All right. All right. So first of all, it's such a gorgeous night out, and so I really appreciate that you're committing to this tonight to be inside, even though it's such a lovely evening. Um, I want to give a big shout out to um, Dr. Julia Sass uh, Rubin for for bringing me in. And I'm going to start tonight with some words of some high schoolers that I recently interviewed. This high schooler said, since we implemented RJ, instead of being suspended, you talk it out. You understand what you did wrong. Understand like how to do something better the next time. And then it kind of limits altercations. I interviewed another student who said, our school used to be one of the top schools that suspended people. And our rates went down after we started implementing RJ. RJ has helped people deal with each other and be able to communicate more and not fight and stuff like that. And that's super important. We're going to circle back to these quotes and these ideas at the end of my talk. But for now, I want to point out that students here are mentioning the importance of learning <coughs> discipline incidents. They're talking about increasing understanding, communicating more effectively, and learning to do better next time. Those are key ideas for us. So there's been a widespread kind of national shift towards learning and repairing harm after discipline incidents. Um, and this really springs from research over the past decades that have shown the typical go-to in, in school discipline isn't particularly effective. So the go-to, as I see it, is often a punitive approach that relies on removing students from classroom and from the building. So efforts to reduce the use of school exclusionary discipline, so that's really think like you know, ISS, in-school suspension, OSS, out-of-school suspension. So there's been a move that have mushroomed over the past years. And I want to share some research that has really propelled that kind of mushrooming. So let me start um, making some, some, presenting some data to you. So a recent study showed that each additional suspension a student um, receives decreases their odds of graduating high, high school by 20%. Um, so that's pretty profound. There's some evidence, in fact, that when kids receive suspension, students receive suspension, that behaviors can actually worsen. So if we think about a 
an intervention. Suspension is an intervention to help. It might not help it, many, many youth. In fact, not graduating from high school, we know, has huge economic ramifications for the students themselves and also for the labor market in general. A recent study just came out last year that followed students um, for about 12 years after suspension. And it, and it showed that students were less likely to earn um, a BA. They were less likely to graduate from a four-year college compared to similar non-suspended peers. So the problem of suspension actually goes beyond the school doors. It has been linked to what people call the school-to-prison pipeline. So how many people have heard that phrase, the school to prison pipeline, right? So we're hearing more and more about this notion. And we know that um, when, when students receive suspension, they're at an increased risk for negative contact with the police and the JJ system. A Texas study followed youth over time, and it found that if a student received a discretionary school vi violation, they were three times more likely than other youth to have contact, negative contact, with the juvenile justice system the next school year. So that's pretty profound. So why might this be? We have to think about why might suspension really have these negative impacts on students? Well, you can think about students going home not having as much adult monitoring. Maybe they're affiliating with other folks who are engaging in more serious negative contact conduct. But I've often been very concerned when you hear about preschoolers and first graders being suspended. What's happening to them in terms of their sense of school as a place of belonging, a place of learning? Um, they could become more alienated. And if they feel like they've been unfairly treated or discriminated against, even more breaches in trust. In traditional school discipline, there's an emphasis on the breaking of the rules, as we've already heard today, instead of a repairing of the harm. So this is a quite a dense slide with lots of information. You see the kind of traditional approach on one side. It's again, it's kind of focused on harm. The restorative approach tends to be oriented towards how did the incident impact all the people who witnessed it, who were harmed by it? How can people take responsibility and, and make opportunity for people who are harmed to have a, a space to vocalize and talk about how they were impacted? We often don't see that when it comes to suspension. So exclusionary discipline has a greater negative impact on some groups more than others. And I'm going to walk you through that. So what drove me to do this work? Many of you might be thinking. I, mean, I am an economically privileged white woman, a mother of a six-year-old who's married to a woman. But all my life, I grew up in Brooklyn, I have been concerned about issues of equity. I grew up in Brooklyn in the 70s and 80s. You didn't have to walk far to see huge gaps in wealth and poverty and also experience racial and linguistic diversity. So fast forward to college, there was incidents across campus in which there was racist and homophobic epithets written all over the walls in the library. What we did is we pulled together the LGBT groups, groups fighting for civil rights and African American groups. We learned to work at the intersection of issues around hate and bias. And it was really, it taught me a lot about pursuing that work. I taught in alternative school, after school programs, residential treatment. I ran counseling interventions in low income schools. But it was in graduate school that my interest became very solidified. I worked in the St. Quentin Men's Prison. And it was there where I taught so many men, and particularly men of color, where I felt like there was a profound loss of potential, absolutely profound, that we were locking so many folks up, so many men of color particularly. So I became devoted in my work to help support schools in keeping students engaged in school, moving towards high school graduation, especially students from disproportionately suspended groups. So, this, so now going back to some of the data. The Center for Civil Rights Remedies, if anyone's interested, they've got a bit of a clunky website, but under their research, they have a lot of good reports that they're pulling on national data. Um, so we see here, again, this is a lot to look at here, but I want to, this is from 2011, 2012, and when folks started, came in earlier, I had the GAO um, report up to show that in the 2013 and 2014 data, there's very similar trends around disparities. By the way, we've seen some reduction in suspension rates over the past years, but uh, racial disparities, but also disparities for students with disabilities have remained entrenched. 
I want to also highlight here, as I noted, that for 18% of secondary students with disabilities, they received one or more suspensions in that school year. And the most at-risk group for suspension are secondary students with disabilities, so that's middle and high school students, especially students with IEPs and special ed. Um, and you can see that here, that um, the most at risk of the students um, in terms of receiving suspension are black males with disability at the highest risk for suspension. But I also want to point out that for African American females with disabilities, it's also a high rate. In fact, it's higher than for white males with disability. So there are many groups. There's, a, there's exclusionary discipline has greater impact on many other groups as well. I want to make sure to point that out in terms of low income students. I already mentioned male students. The gender gap in discipline starts in pre-K, and it's pretty profound. So we need to also think about issues around gender and schooling. Latino youth, the disparities really depend on the region and the country. Native American youth, the disparities are really off the charts for that group. And there's emerging evidence for LGBT youth, LGBT youth and gender non-conforming youth that they may also be at higher risk for receiving suspension. Now before moving on, I need to do one of those kind of veer to the side for a second. I'm using very oversimplified categories. We know that, um, I'm using kind of, when I talk about African American students or racial and ethnic categories or Asian students, it's really an oversimplification of very complex experiences, rich and diverse ethnic experiences, so I need to do a caveat. For example, here in New Jersey, and I don't expect you to see all this slide, but we have a very, very diverse Hispanic or Latinx population, folks coming from Puerto Rico, Mexico, the DR, et cetera, very rich uh, immigration histories in this country. Of course, for the same thing for Asian groups, um, we have an increasing population of folks from India, China, the Philippines. So I, I am acknowledging that these categories are too simplistic. I just want to put that out there, although I will continue to use them, so <laughs> apologies. <laughs> um, but I also want to recognize that folks are not one category. We have what they call intersectional identities, right? We have diverse languages, diverse religions, gen diverse gender identities, sexual identities, learning needs, immigrant status, just to name a few. So this is kind of the basics in 101 around thinking about cultural competence and diversity. We do need to obviously think very complexly about each other. And so with that said, I move on to oversimplify that <laughs> So if you'll just bear with me. So you're going to hear me today talking a lot about disparities between black and white students. That's because that has really been the bulk of the work that's been done. And it's not just that I focused on that for over a decade, but really that's where a lot of the research is, has gone. And we need a lot more research around other groups, so I want to put that out there. I mentioned to you that there's been a drop in suspension between 2011 and 2014 Across the nation, suspensions drop by 20%. So there's there's change of foot, but disparities have remained. And you can see here, this is K-12 from the 13-14 data. You can see the disparities here. Here's the big point I want to also make sure to take home. And I will get to restorative justice, so we will cover that, I promise. But I want to point out that black and white differences in income, perceived behavior, and achievement do not explain away all the disparities. In because a lot of people will say to me, well, so it's, you know, it's about income gaps or, you know, uh, special ed status gaps or achievement gaps. And sure, that's part of some of the story because we've got this complexity in thinking about, in my perspective, structural racism. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of studies showing that disparities remain. So the first study that really got people's attention was 2011, Texas. They followed cohorts over time. They compared very similar students over time. In fact, they took into account, for anyone who's interested in stats, 83 different variables when they were comparing students. So it was like grade retention, um, to name a few things like gender, income status. And they found that accounting for those, African American students still had a 31% higher likelihood of school discipline action. Okay, so let's pause for a minute. What this suggests is that so African American kids are being more punitively sanctioned for behavior in schools on average. Okay, so not it's not happening everywhere, but it's, it was happening pervasive enough in Texas to be picked up in these studies. And here's another study. By the way, this is a there's many of these studies. I guess not all night presenting these studies, but let me just give you one more, and then I'll move on. And so this is really for the hardcore stats people in the audience. Um, okay. 
So this is the 6th to 12th grade students in Kentucky over three years they followed these students. In the first, they first found that black students had eight times higher odds of receiving suspension compared to white students. Okay, so that should not just be a cold hard statistic. That is like spiritually difficult to sit with, right? Even though we're looking at a chart, but I think there's a lot of a lot of families for being impacted here in kids. But anyway, in their statistics, they took into account variables such as school, which school buildings kids went to, students' differences in SDS, gender, special ed status, and family structure. And they still found that black students, which I put up, were still more likely to be suspended, two and a half times more likely. So what we're seeing here is, yes, there's multiple contributors to the black and white gap in suspension. You can see that, right? It goes from like close to eight to two and a half. It's complicated. This is not a simple issue. But we still need to be talking about issues of race, because we still see that black students are being punitively treated um, when it comes to, to school, out of school suspension. So what I always like to say is racial disparities are multiply determined. We kind of know how complicated a lot of structural issues are in our society. But at the same time, we also need to talk about race around this issue, um, which can be actively avoided in many situations I've experienced. All right, so what are schools doing? So now we're getting to kind of, now we're in 2018. In, in the work that I've been doing, I would say maybe in the past eight years, there's been a lot of movement across the nation. I'm just going to summarize a little bit, but I'm going to focus on restorative justice. But I didn't want to let you know there's a lot of different work going on around addressing these issues. So I just, for example, give you Syracuse's Code of Conduct, their cover. They spent months with about 250 stakeholders trying to come up with consensus on how to change their Code of Conduct. They call it now the Code of Conduct Capture and Support. So I read a lot of Code of Conducts, and usually it's, you know, defiance equals in-school suspension, you know, theft equals out-of-school suspension, by, you know, so it's a matrix of kind of, you know, behavior or incident, discipline incident, and then a punishment. Um, but Syracuse did it differently. So if you all are interested in thinking about, I'm not sure what your code looks like, I didn't do that kind of sleuth thing yet, but I'm sure I can find it online. Um, they did move towards a social emotional learning approach through their code. So this is their opening preamble. They say the code ensures that schools provide equal access, that's my highlights, equal access. So they have an equity orientation. In fact, this revision was all done under kind of under the hot seat of civil rights discrimination and them having to come address a consent decree. Um, the code ensures that schools provide equal access to a wide range of supports and interventions that promote positive behavior, help students develop self-discipline, and social-emotional efficacy. And here's another important sentence. And enable students to improve and correct <coughs> inappropriate, unacceptable, and unskillful behavior. So in this little opening, which caught my eye, I thought, now here's something different the first time I read this. I, I kind of perked up. But okay, wait, they're oriented towards social-emotional learning, they're, they're nodding towards equity. They're also interested in opportunities to improve and learn. Now, they've had some struggle up and down reading news accounts of Syracuse rollout, um, but I think the document itself is worth reviewing because I think they take seriously the notion of social emotional learning. So, I just give you these are considered the kind of five competencies that, in my field, people roll out all the time. So, just in brief, we do want to encourage both students. And staff. Okay. Did you hear that? Students and staff to increase social awareness, perspective taking, and empathy. That's that first one. To build constructive and respectful relationships. To take responsible decision making seriously, which means establishing and maintaining healthy and rewarding relationships. Becoming self aware. And this is where we can think about equity a lot. This notion of understanding your own implicit bias, your own yep. um, recognizing your regulating, recognize your own how your own perceptions or cultural glasses mm. affect how you see other people. And I think that's both for students and staff to work on. Um, but also self-management, how we regulate emotions. I spend a lot of time in schools. I am often struck with how off the charts the screaming is from the staff, you know, thinking like, hmm, 
can this be used well? Like, what is this screaming for? Or is this just about really learning regulation skills from the staff? Um, so a lot of schools use something called PBIS. Some of you may have heard positive behavior intervention support. So that's another talk. But what I do want to just say, if you're interested in learning about that, they just put out this culturally responsive field guide. So what's happening now is all these interventions reform is now trying to say, now how do we think about equity in these reforms? How do we now think about differential treatment if we have a more support, social, emotional learning oriented um, school? So for example here, um, identity and bias awareness is this idea of really bringing staff together to understand they may be holding beliefs outside their awareness that we all can have implicit racial bias. And this has like been a big field of study that shows it can affect our decision making. Um, so there was recently a study where they, and this is just one study, so we're going to take it with a grain of salt, but they tracked the eye gaze of uh, preschool teachers looking at a video of kids playing a preschool classroom. So they showed the, the teachers the preschool classroom. They had eye tracking software, and they said, just tell us when you see the precursors to negative behavior. And it turns out there was no negative behavior. It was all set up, right? The kids were just all being cooperative. It turns out the teachers watched the black kids more than the other kids. So they were under surveillance. Oh, those kids are going to know. I don't know what they're thinking, but some, you know, so unconsciously, potentially, like, what's going on about surveying? African-American kids in these classrooms. So a provocative study. Another thing is the situational appropriateness is trying to weave in this notion of cultural competence, that we have to learn more about code switching. Kids are coming with different kinds of behavioral norms in school, out of school, from the home, and teaching teachers about this notion of not having a deficit orientation, but understanding the importance of code switching. So we could talk a lot about that. But I'm going to move on to restorative practices, because I want to make sure we have the most time that tonight. So, where are we right now? I'm moving to part three. Part one was the negative correlates of OSS, disparities in suspension of racial and disability status. Schools are up to a lot around changes of code and conduct, increasing bias, awareness, and culturally responsive teaching, and now into RJ and restorative practice. So, I am interested in restorative practice because I've always been really intrigued by how we use relationships to leverage engagement. You, everyone in this room has had a teacher, just raise your hand, a teacher you really connected with over time at some point in your life. Now that teacher could actually pretty much do anything, right? They're, they could, you know, you'd be a little dysregulated, maybe like, come on, sit down right there. And you'd be like, well, sit down because we and I know we care about each other, right? But other people might say, sit down, and you might just get, don't tell me to sit down. You know, so a lot of times it's about that relationship. In the beginning, I started studying like all these micro -inter interactions, it's all about like, don't, don't humiliate in public. And I learned that, no, 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 the teachers with really good relationship, they could call people out in public. And as long as that foundation and trust was there, they'd be like, no, we call that kid out in public. That's how we play. That's how we go together. You know, we know how to do this together. So I think I just got more intrigued by relationships. And restorative justice and restorative practice is all about relationships. All right. So the other thing I throw in here, and I have to tell you, is my personal spin. I highlight social-emotional learning in restorative practice. I don't happen to think trainers do this enough. We need to be explicit in restorative practices of when people are learning those five competencies I talked about. How is that happening through the practice? I'm going back to this dense slide. I want to just highlight a few things. I hear this a lot in districts. Well, restorative practice is all about squishy, softness, kids are going to run amok. And you know, I have to say, I, I'm like, hey, oh, wait a second, so is, you can only be held accountable if you're asked to leave the building? Is that our only paradigm around accountability is like exile? And so I actually think, and I participated in the fair amount of restorative practice today, when you have to face up, I mean, if people, who, you know, people who are in relationships know this well, when you have to go and like, oh yeah, I'm not kind of messed up, and, we talk about it, it's actually, it takes a lot of courage. And it takes a lot of courage for the people who've been harmed to come forward. The thing I want to also emphasize, though, it's not that schools are totally doing away with suspension for safety-threatening issues. This is really, we're not, this is not about safety, necessarily. This is about learning behavior, okay? So this is about opportunities. Most suspension is for low-level, minor, non-safety-threatening behavior huge chunks of it. 
It's the defiance. It's the dis. I don't know what y'all call it. It's just like disrespect. Defi I get all different ones. Disrespect, defiance, insubordination, all in that category, right? So there's a lot around power struggles with adults and students are fighting between students. And I think there's so much to learn from working through and figuring out how do I repair the harm? How do I actually take responsibility for this? I should also say it's voluntary. You can't force students into a restorative conference. You can't be like, it's mandated, so therefore you go. It can't, can't be coerced. And I also say it falls flat if the adults running it are not well trusted. It just becomes the same old process. I've interviewed many kids after a story conference and say, all they did was yell at me and tell me I needed to do this and that. And was it, what was it called? Restorative conference. That wasn't restorative conference. You know, so it's been, it's been important for me to understand more about like, what's a high integrity conference? So, before doing that, I want to orient you to how schools are taking what they call, this is another like uh, kind of lingo in my area, multi-tiered systems of support. So these triangles are very big these days in school. When we think about helping kids out, you've got something on the bottom called tier one. People are taking restorative practice and they're laying into these triangles. The first thing is universal. That means all the students are getting advisory in middle school. You all practiced it yesterday, tomorrow you're going to talk Right, the next to, to the, yesterday is like, or today is about community building, and tomorrow there'll be some more activities. So it's this idea that everybody is getting something related to social emotional learning, building relationships and community. You see that part right there, and it's that exactly what we heard earlier. This idea of invest in your building, in your norms, and the students will up, be more likely to uphold, and also build capacity of staff and students, build relationships. The next tier is more like, you know, when the conflict emerges and the rules break, which they always do, can you respond in a restorative way? Tier three is more serious stuff. So we've got two things I'm going to talk about. Conferencing and re-entry, re-entry circles for kids who've had long-term absences. And um, I'm going to show you a video. So let, let me start with community building circles. This one was held in Oakland. Actually, both videos I'm going to show tonight were held in Oakland. At, um, this one's at Met West High School. So let me transfer over and get the sound right. So this is going to be about a seven minute video. Guys, you guys give me a lot of and stuff like that. Our advisory is like a family. 
I've been through police brutality, tragedies, and stuff like that. And instead of me being depressed about life, I know I can come in and talk to my community. They understand. And most of the time, if it's something I'm going through, they've probably already been through it before. People won't be fucking shy and stuff like that, you know. I want the ice cream and you know, everybody else, you know, y'all get in a good mood, you ain't worried, you talk. The way it comes and blows, if you live in Oak, there's rain all comes and takes anyone whose shirt is black. The wind comes and takes anyone that likes to play basketball. Anybody who has headphones. Anybody that lives in East Oakland. Uh, if you're wearing shorts. Blows uh, if. You get more freedom now. You get to know people really deeply. If you look back on your childhood, you realize that there's certain things that. So thanks for your attention. So that's a. I'm going to back up to the triangle for a second. That you all, some of you may have experienced today, the community building circles. An example of that there. Here's a student who reflected on um, their circle during advisory. It will help staff grow because it's not just students that are part of the circle, it's the teachers too. And that's important because they need to understand where we're coming from. They could understand maybe that's why I'm not in the mood today or what happened this morning or last night may cause me to act out during the day. So I've spoken to a lot of youth and surveyed maybe 2,000, about their experience of circles. And I can say that there is a tremendous positive orientation towards having a voice and connection, getting to know one another. Students can also critique it for the students not being well behaved enough, not having enough structure. So certainly they can rerun poorly, and students don't have that experience. But overwhelmingly, I've seen students who really talked about this idea of being seen by their teachers in a different way. It's not about the course content, it's being heard and seen differently, and that they're able to connect with that teacher during other times. Okay, conferencing. I've mentioned this a little bit. A, t a typical conference includes, it's a more, this is for a more serious discipline incident. People have to uh, voluntarily participate. So that underscore voluntary. Um, there's pre-meetings, people are set up. You don't just kind of fling people together in this. You, you're thoughtful about the engagement. People who've been harmed by an incident can bring supporters. People who are considered the dispute, they can bring supporters. Um, so and all those harms can participate. So sometimes I've seen pretty big conferences if many people were involved in an incident. You have a trained facilitator with a set script, really, even a seating chart around where people sit. Um, and you ask a set of structured questions. So I, I did a study with the Denver Public School data recently and another one that's coming out soon. But we showed that students who participate who are in the kind of sent into the discipline system for some kind of serious incident, if they participated in the fall at a conference, they were less likely to go into the discipline system, be sent back for a future suspension or receive a discipline referral relative to their disciplined peers who didn't participate in a restorative conference. Um, so we still need to know a lot more about what's going on with that arrow. So if you have a really well-run conference, what is the special sauce? There's a few things I want to say that I do see that I think is problematic in the field or that I don't have science on it. That sometimes um, conferences, because of the busy school day, there's not always follow-up if there's an action plan. I mean, the, the, if there's an agreed-upon action to repair the harm, there needs to be structure set up in advance to really follow it through. Um, and there needs to be follow up with the people who've been harmed to find out if they think the conference was a resolution too. So there has to be policies and procedures and resources in terms of personnel to actually put these in well. So The other piece is restorative dialogue. So this is something that um, if you've got trained in restorative practice, 
you would learn to ask these types of questions on a regular basis as a teacher. So after a discipline incident, what happened? What were you thinking about at the time? And what have your thoughts been since? Who has been affected by what you did? In what way have they been affected? And what do you think you need to do to make things right? So if we really think about this at a, in the tier two of our triangle, backing up for a second, this should be integrated into the fabric of a school system in my perspective. That um, I interviewed a student who said, yeah, in my neighborhood, I get in a conflict, and then I pause, and they always say, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm asking myself the restorative questions. <laughs> but it's not just that the teacher, everybody, the staff, I mean, I think what I can see is restorative practices get siloed. They get like, oh, well, that's the RJ coordinator. I can't deal with that. Let them deal with it. But I think the whole point is that there's a community engagement around problem-solving approaches to discipline. And, and you can, if you, these are carefully crafted questions. It's not, you know, um, you know, you did wrong, tell me why you did it, don't you know better, the, the regular script. It's really trying to push the onus on the people in the incident to think through what happened and do some problem solving. Okay, finally, um, re-entry circles. So we're gonna now watch a video, a good 10 minutes of it, because I think it's worth it, where students, um, re-entry circles are for students who've been out for a long time related to a discipline incident. This particular student had been incarcerated. He was coming at a juvenile hall, and he, this is his re-entry into the system. Now, I want to point out that it is rare. You're going to see this is going to look different. A re-entry circle is really about trying to facilitate re-engagement in the community. So it's not just like bring your parent in, talk to the AP, and we'll kind of hash through next steps. You're going to see something very different about a very thoughtful re-entry re procedure. Sounds very kind of rocket ship. Here we go. Circle know that 
We're all pretty much the same. We're here to welcome, support, and navigate into this school again. And hopefully through the rest of this life. So in this next round, we're going to agree on the things that we need in order to be able to have this conversation. This talking piece gives everybody else permission to listen deeply. Without values, we're not listening deeply. We're waiting on our opportunity to talk. If there's a value that you don't agree with, we're going to do another round and tell them really that value we're we'll talking about. Commitment. Respect. The only speaking truth. Compassion. Honesty. Forgiveness. Empathy. It's important to be connected. I started noticing that I wasn't here to stereotype me. I was here to help and see what was going on in my head. So I started to loosen up a little bit. Last year I didn't have confidence. I would tell you too. Oh, I'd been kicked out of class, man, like a pound of weed in class. So I was doing bad at last year. We're going to talk about what do you have to give to support the system. And, and I want you to talk directly to the system. I'm a person who you can come to any time of day. If I am a person who will be your brother, who will be your uncle, I got your back. I got stuff for you. Come and get it. Especially our kids, study, keep it in real. That's their whole life. Who's real? Who's not real? And they can tell better than any one of us if you're keeping it real. And I say this in front of everybody because if I don't, I need all these people to hold me accountable. I'm the person that's opportunity to I'm the person you can count on. I'm the person you can also just say, hey, I need to talk to you. Give me a few minutes today. I'm also going to be a person that loves you, loves you to death. All right. <laughs> and I am the person who's going to ensure that we will get your high school diploma and be on with your life. Otherwise, there can be um, reluctant compliance. 
So it would really be the same. The students are the ones to sniff this out quickly. This is the same old thing. I've also had a school psychologist come up to me and say, yeah, we're doing this in our district, but I, I'm in those meetings, and it really feels like the same old thing with a different label on top. It's like a rebranding, but nothing's really changed. So, I mean, I guess my recommendations are to um, draw on what's been done. There's, there's some really good work already out there that's public. So, for instance, in San Francisco Unified, they spend time really talking with a lot of people about the collective will for this. So, do people feel there's a need? Are, are enough people on board to really to work on this shift and really trying to make sure people are thinking about the hearts and minds process? I can't emphasize that first bullet enough. A new leader can enter a building, and it's been a rocky road for restorative practices, and then suddenly things, pathways are open, and, and, and also staff can be sent to trainings, but if they don't feel that it's really legitimately seen and valued, they'll say, no, 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 I get the real deal. I mean, one, so one story, these faculty who spend time in this training, multi-day training on how to run circles, so she goes to her room, she starts it out, the principal storms into her room and says, what are you doing? You need to kind of get back. She said, well, you just sent me to this training. I mean, so kind of looking for those, you really want a consistency and coherence. Students should be engaged. I mean, the best RP rollout and RJ rollout, I've seen student leaders who are working hand in hand with administration and change. Here's the other piece. We've got a lot of problems with train and hope. People, re, people are putting thousands of dollars for release time and training time up front, three to four day trainings, and then it's like, well, good luck, go get them. And then it just doesn't go anywhere. So I cannot also emphasize the need for a very strategic implementation plan with lots of supports. And this is what one teacher said, and I think this is the share of many. There's so many initiatives, it's hard to know what to prioritize. Once you leave a training, you get in your classroom. There's so much they expect from you. We have a training, maybe that next week we go in and use those circles, then it gets lost. In fact, here's um, some survey data I took with people after a restorative practice training. They were like, that's right, we're so into this. Like implementation and our administration is all, can, it fits with how I do work, it's gonna be useful. I follow them over time. This was a community building circle training. Turns out 50% never did a circle after that. Huge drop off. Um, so again, you gotta be th thoughtful about what do we know from a lot of the science around professional development? People need demonstrations, co-facilitation, experiential learning, held staff meetings and circles. Um, there should be, restorative practice needs to be within the culture so that even conflict among the staff is dealt with in a restorative way. Parents are addressed in a restorative way. Coaching is a big component of these kinds of programs these days. Booster workshop, PLCs, you name it. The other piece is teachers need to feel supported. If they ask a student to leave their room and the student, oh, you driving me crazy, you're interrupting instruction, get out, get out, or call security, get out. And then suddenly the student kind of waltzes back in 20 minutes later and sits down and the teacher's like, what? See, the administrator's not supporting us. They're doing something called restorative practice. I don't even know what they're doing. And I hear this a lot, that there's no feedback loop to the teachers to find out what went on, or engagement around the process. So before rolling things out, all of those procedures need to be carefully thought through so teachers feel heard in the process and supported. And then, of course, accountability checks of making sure whatever the new practices are actually, are they actually happening. All right, so I'm going to end and open up for Q&A just with the words of restorative justice coordinator in one of the schools I'm in. She says, what appeals to me about RJ is that it provides grace. It deals with the person first and not the problem. It comes with the understanding that maybe the problem happened as a result of something going on with that person. And if we can get to the understanding of the person, of their concept of who they are, and even build a relationship, then we can come up with a creative solution and alternative to dealing with the problem. The victim is able to look at the offender in the eye, having forgiveness in their heart. The offender being able to apologize and be held accountable in the community versus just punishment sent away to jail or getting kicked out of school. So I'll end with her words. Thank you so much for your attention.
Thank you, thank you, thank you. So you said so many things that uh, during the course of your talk it really brought up tears for me. I mean, I wish the hell that I had had this when I was in school. It would have saved me a whole lot of trouble. You know, to, to me the key thing is trust. That's the word I heard that really hit me. If students don't trust that the teacher really cares about them or the administrator really cares about them, this is all just a pipe dream. So it's really up to the individual relationships, like you kept saying over again. Does the teacher, does the administrator, do, do the adults demonstrate over and over again that they really care about the, each individual? And then, how, you know, this is the training is so important, then how do you sustain it? That feedback loop, the uh, making sure that the people feel supported, that people aren't out there doing it alone. You need, this is too hard to do alone. And, um, yeah, that thing about that each person, each student, each staff feels heard and really cared about. That, I mean, if we're not doing that, what are we doing teaching X's and O's and subjects and math and everything else if we're not really demonstrating that each person's important and that we really care about each other? Then what the heck are we teaching? Thank you. Thank you for your comment. The idea of repairing trust when it's breached too. So it's also that you're fostering trust, but then that you really are thinking carefully about how to repair the trust. I just want to know, will there, do you have pamphlets or information for the young people to be able to take with them? Because this, they can't take with them, but they need something that they can keep taking going over and over in their head. To get I can send you this PowerPoint, or if I don't know how to distribute, I don't have pamphlets. <laughs> We're also taking it, so it'll be available. Okay. Thank you. Just to piggyback on what the gentleman said, this was an extraordinary presentation. My question is, the focus tonight has been on the disparity of discipline on children of color, and it kind of starts with what happens uh, to address the behavior. My question is, is there any uh, information or criteria uh, and has what makes these children be disciplinary problems been looked at and what I'm getting at is could it be that children of color uh, are not addressed with the same expectations of learning is there some bias uh, when they're in the classroom that causes them to act out uh, these, these are all very significant issues uh, and I think that uh, more time should be spent on how teachers are addressing children of color because if we don't address the cause and causation of their disciplinary behavior that needs to be corrected then we're not starting at the beginning. Thank you. Actually, um, that's, a, that's an opening to what I wanted to say. Um, I was sort of piggybacking on some of the notes because I, of course, got here late, so I don't really know what took place earlier, but I'm glad that I got here. Um, I highlighted, um, and this is something I highlighted. It says in the 90s, no one was talking about the racial uh, distance gaps. I mean, I, I'm not going to tell you how old I am. But, you know, um, I started school, of course, when schools were not even um, integrated, it was still segregated. And, of course, I've attended schools down in the South, and public education is a wonderful place to be. Um, my daughter was a graduate from this school, and she's doing really, really well, which I know a lot of other kids of color do really well, too. But when we take a look at Princeton Regional Schools, it's like one of the top schools in the country. I mean, their kids are really excelling, they're doing really well. And I must say that, you know, my daughter, you know, had a very good experience at uh, Princeton High School. Um, I've always had um, concerns with the hiring practices. We have very few um, teachers of color here at the high school, middle school, elementary school. It's always nice to be able to look out 
and you know, see somebody that looks like you. So um, the, the hiring practices here in Princeton, I mean, I don't know what's going on because this is 2018. 2018, um, and I probably could say that you probably only have 20 um, people of color, probably in the entire district. When you look out and see somebody that looks like you, that's a wonderful feeling. Um, we need to um, understand that, you know, we all bleed the same color of blood. We all breathe the same, you know, type of air. We all exhale, you know, we're all human beings. It would be a boring, dull world if everybody was of the same um, ethnic group. If flowers were all of the same color, it would be a very, very dull place to be. So what I'm simply saying is that um, this sounds like a great program, and you know, not only will it work for kids of color, but also work for you know kids of other nationalities too that have you know some issues. But I was just like highlighting things, um, you know, um, making instruction more motivating and engaging it can reduce classroom behavior problems um, since you know it won't be boring. I, you have to also bring something to the curriculum. When I go to the curriculum, you know, I want to be able to read something about Dr. Martin Luther King. They give you February as the Black History Month. To me, there's every day, 12 months, you know, because what would the world be without black folks? What would the world be without white folks? Uh, so I'm saying that, you know, we have to be able to address the needs and to make sure that our kids feel that they can trust that they can feel warm, they can feel that you're somebody. And I'm going all the way back when my daughter was in school, and issues arise then. The culture, the culture of Princeton Regional Schools, it has to change. The hiring practices here in Princeton Regional Schools, they need to change. We need to bring more people of color so that our black children, our brown children, can see that there's someone that looks just like them. And I think too that that in itself will also curb some of the districts, not only just for black kids, but for white kids as well. And I can go on and on, but I'm going to give the mic to somebody else. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I have a sort of nuts and bolts question. The program sounds wonderful. Um, it's new though, so I'm wondering, one, what kind of training is available? Like, who trains the trainers and how school districts get hold of this? And as an adjunct to that, um, I have two special needs kids, one in Princeton Public Schools, and we found that like the whole experience was dramatically different for them once they were classified special needs. And acknowledging that special needs students of color are still disproportionately suspended, is it possible that students of color are not being identified and classified in the first place, which would provide them with a qualitatively different experience that wasn't so discipline heavy and was more meaning than where they are? That's a big topic. Underclassification, overclassification, you know, people have argued in both ways and research has looked at both ways. I mean, I, I think ultimately I would kind of just moving away from the, the classification piece is just to think about all kids need behavioral support, support some more than others. And so the question is, is how can all kids have access, differentiated access? But also, all of us at times in our lives need behavioral supports, right? So, and again, some more consistently than others. But just trying to think about how as a school system, people, you all, everyone's thinking about social and emotional literacy, just like a, t a content area, is what are we doing on a regular basis to kind of build up skills? But I also want to backtrack to the hiring issue because People are hiring, um, also trying to think about screening hiring and bringing in more teachers of color. That's, um, there's a lot of research showing now that teachers of color perceive, let's say, African American males less negatively than white teachers. If a, there was another study showing if a student had at least one black teacher in their career, they had higher chances of graduation. I mean, there's a lot of evidence to show that you know, even a single teacher, but also that there's this kind of this importance of being reflected back both in the curriculum and through the instructors is so key for the welfare of students. But any teacher that comes into the system, they have to also come from experience in manual, manual education. What can they bring to the table? What experiences do they have? What can they bring? You know, because if they bring little no experiences, then that really defeats the purpose. Right, right. Yes, of course, there has to be high quality teachers. 
Um, so I just wanted to, to reiterate that though. And um, the other kind of backing up a little bit about uh, hit, going back to the beginning, sorry you mentioned this idea of looking at um, issues of kind of bias early on. So a lot of districts are spending more time reflecting on how even in pre-K and first grade, what, why are these higher suspension rates coming out, um, trying to understand more about kind of punitive reactivity, criminalization of kids of color. So there's a lot of districts who are kind of trying to engage in deep work. People are using data. So if they, they'll look at their discipline data and say, well, hold on a second. Disruption defiance seems to be our biggest category. So what is it, what's culturally biased in our read around disruption and trying to kind of as a staff try to deconstruct that and understand how in interactions it can link end up kind of an escalating situation. But also if students don't feel fairly treated and they're standing up for themselves because they feel like they've been discriminated against, trying to understand that. I interviewed 50 teachers. I said, have you ever been accused of being racist and how did you handle it? I was really struck with the vast majority said, oh, I just dismissed that. That's like the race part. But there was a handful of teachers who said, no, I need to engage with that and understand why, what is it about my behavior where, where students are, of color are feeling unfairly treated? And so those are the kinds of engagement that I've seen faculty try to kind of engage more in understanding that reflective practice around their cultural being. So that's where the training comes in, though. So the training. So, um, so there's a, a lot of training organizations out there. Um, some integrate issues of equity and social emotional learning more than others. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, so there's a big training group, it's in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, they're called uh, the International Institute for Restorative Practices, they kind of employ trainers all over the country, but there's a lot of other training groups out there too. So I don't promote one particular group per se, I don't do the training myself, um, but I would say in thinking about vendors and contracts, the key piece is the thing I would think from my perspective about issues of equity, cultural competence, social emotional learning, and implementation supports. People do a great upfront training. It's really like, what happens next? And to me, it, you get a lot of great upfront training all over the place. It's more about, okay, so how are we gonna roll this out? What are the supports from, from coaches after this? But does part of that training deal with what the gentleman in the back talks about, just acknowledging race and what race means? Yeah, I mean, so right now, I, um, Julia mentioned that I'm going to do a, a large study in Brooklyn, and I'm working with a group called the Morningside Center for Teaching Social Responsibility, which is a big mouthful. But they have a, a focus on restorative practice, social emotional learning, and equity. So right now, that's what we're studying, is they're trying to roll out those three pieces, buckets, all together in their Rethinking Discipline program. So there are trainers that are really trying to kind of think about the synthesis of all these issues. Hi. Um, so I had a question. I was wondering if you had any data, whether it was through survey or through interviews, on you know two, three, four years into school districts or a school that has implemented restorative justice practices. What happens then to the culture and to teacher satisfaction? to how it affects academic learning, um, how it affects satisfaction of the teachers in their job as teaching the content. That's Is there any question. data like that? That's a great question. We don't have enough work on that. We don't have enough empirical studies on that. You know, there was a big evaluation in Oakland, but they were doing a lot. They were doing um, not just restorative justice, and staff were generally feeling like the climate was good, discipline was good, there was a positive attitude towards it. But you're going to see lots of more news accounts have come out, at least from an anecdotal perspective, with union reps coming forward and saying, this isn't going well. But we don't honestly, in my perspective, have enough yet to know about, ultimately, like years down the line. We don't have, um, I mean, there's, there's a lot more research abroad. So there's some studies out of Scotland and um, some other countries that have shown some positive effects on school climate. Um, but again, we need a lot more on that. So I'm sorry to punt that issue. I'm just, I'm just being the hardcore scientist right now. I don't want to overstate findings. We have a lot of data showing discipline referrals go down. Not I feel like I can confidently say, but we need to not just know discipline referrals go down. We need engagement to go up, support of climate, welfare for teachers. I mean, so yeah, we've established that one thing, but we really need the other side of the point. 
I was just curious, there's so much emphasis on the students being more for discipline. Um, but when we, does this process ever identify um, problematic teachers? In other words, if, if it's the same teacher constantly referring students out, and, you know, does it ever come around to addressing the difficulties with teachers have yeah, perhaps? So, I mean, if you integrate the, the work around data and equity, it should theoretically, right? So I have worked with districts around their use of data. So it's not just to identify your frequent flyers in the discipline. It's also your frequent flyer teachers or educators. And look, they're having a bad day. I mean, it's no fun to kick kids out and have lots of immersive interactions, so they need support. And so I think the key thing is, is how do you support those teachers I mean, this is like, you know, without it being this punitive experience for them. Um, I was involved in a teacher coaching program, and, and it was a teachers got assigned a particular coach. They submitted a videotape of their classroom instruction, and it was really tight, meaning that the coach actually sliced the tape to show, look at that interaction. It's so supportive, it's engaging, it's motivating. You need to grow that. We're going to work together for plans to grow that. It's a strength-based coaching model. But those teachers had no disparities in discipline referrals at the end of it, compared to the control the randomized control trial. So they, what they did, they didn't focus on the discipline. They focused on engaging in back to instruction, engaging in motivating um, content with supportive relationships. That was the focus of it. It wasn't don't refer kids out. But the correlates, the positive findings of that, was they had no more racial discipline gap in the classroom. But the control group did. They maintained they were kicking African American students out of higher grades. Hey, thank you again. This was amazing. I'll just say what everybody else has said. Um, it strikes me as well that there's a lot of work that actually needs to be done within a school district, both staff, um, families, kids. Before you get to this, this notion of having teachers forcing teachers, staff, to recognize internal bias, to see them, right? This is all brand new for so many teachers. So it feels like there's a whole lot of work, if you're really invested in this, that has to go in first, before this happens, before all the follow-up work to make sure that it's done well and real. Just thought your thoughts on that. I, I mean, I'm tracking lots of implementation. I'm of two minds. It's like, it's time already, right? On the one hand, I feel a sense of urgency. You know, there's an urgency around equity in school. I don't have to say that. You all are here, so there's an urgency. But on the other hand, I, I also think things can go really belly up in terms of uh, people, the staff really pushing back our families in a way that's kind of productive, I would say. So what I would say is that what I've admired in some districts is they, go, they work with a demonstration school. They don't do a thin implementation across all the schools. They work hard with one particular school. And they try to grow it that way. And then they, you know, so in Denver, there's been some good writing where they'll, they had demonstration schools and then they started fanning out across the district. Um, the problem that to me happens when it's really just this thin implementation plan and um, a lot of the procedures and policies aren't in great place. I mean, the other, but it is a hearts and minds issue. Here, I just want to share one thing. One of the schools who've been at it for about six years that I've been working with, they, a teacher told me in an interview last year, and it still resonates with me. She said, you know, we first started this, we were in all these dialogues. We kept saying, what's the purpose of discipline as a staff? What are, we, what are our beliefs? They said, we kept asking the heart-wrenching questions, and then we did restorative practices, and then we dropped all those questions. But there's so much turnover in new students that she said, you know what? We need to ask that every single semester. What's the purpose of discipline? What, how are we feeling about the discipline system? And she said, it's a loss that we can keep engaging. It's kind of more soul-searching, getting people on board with the philosophy. She was saying that that's been a loss. But at that same school, Every single day, they held an open meeting at the end of the day to say what behavioral issues came up today. Everyone's welcome to come and talk about them and let's think through a restorative solution that fits with our values and our constitution in this school. And they said it was not easy. It's not a recipe book. You're talking about trying to repair harm with logical consequences connected to the act. It took a lot of engagement and, and commitment to thinking through outside the box and what would it mean to restore something in this context. So I just, that's another take home point, was it took time, commitment, and resources. They held a meeting every day after school, open meeting. 
if they needed to. It was populated by teachers, and students, and staff. The principal AP there every time. And can you do two more quick ones? I know it's almost 8 30, so you got to get back. Okay, so two more. Uh, hi. So, uh, in the six years that I've lived uh, in Princeton mostly, I've noticed that there's a number of kids who, um, when it comes to community circles and stuff like that, they would scoff at it and be like, oh yes, like that's useless, it's not going to do anything. Um, what would you say to these kids? So, I think it can be useless if it's not done well. I mean, I think that what it had to me, a, a good circle has high relevance to you, the, the topic. So, you know, some places like Morningside, they have a curriculum that I think is, you know, very youth oriented. But at the same time, there needs to be topics that have high centrality to what are on the top of students' minds to make it feel relevant. So that's a piece of it. The other piece is there's always going to be some students who kind of pass in the circle and are going to be a little more disaffected in the process. But I would say that overall, if run well in terms of kids respecting the talking piece of the space, that students report a lot of gains from it. And so I could say over and over again, like this last study I did out of a thousand students, like 90% of the kids, students said, like, I wish we had more. I mean, that's right, sure, 10%, well, that's a waste of time. But I would expect that there's going to be diversity of opinion about it. And also, some of the students said, I wish this was graded, which was interesting. Because like, no one takes it seriously unless there's a grade attached. Just put a grade on advisory. <laughs> um, but he, he was concerned. He, wanted, he showed how much he wanted people to take it seriously. So he was hearing that disgruntled. Thank you. It was a great question. Oh, gosh. There's... OK. Yes, um, this was really good. Thank you for bringing our attention to this problem or concern that we all have. Somehow we share the same concern. Um, I just wanted to know that did you knew, do you have the numbers for the Princeton School District as far as uh, this problem of uh, white versus black uh, discipline problems? No, I don't have that. Um, is that something that can be made available to us, or is there a place we can find that in the okay. district? <laughs> right here. Right. Because I'm concerned that um, I don't have those numbers, and it's something that I'd like to. Be familiar with as a parent and a taxpayer in Princeton. It's actually public information. Um, the Department of Education publishes it on the school report card, so you can pull it off the DOE website. We just go to the Jersey Department of Education, but I think the superintendent's going to. Yeah, well, I'm not, I'm not going to go into detail because I don't have everything right in front of me. But the numbers, the numbers are, are fairly, fairly small. So as I said, we're looking at about 30. Two students currently this year um, who've been suspended for in a district of almost 4,000. Um, I think it's about 10 at the high school, um, 10 students overall. Pardon? These are short-term suspensions. And, and as, as you were pointing out, um, when we look at suspensions, you can look at sort of the um, more subjective suspensions for things like willful disobedience, and then you can look at the more um, objective suspensions for things like possession of, of drugs or drug paraphernalia, possession of a weapon, fighting. Those are the, it's the, it's the objective ones that, for which we're suspending students. Um, the numbers are very small. So if there are 32 students, one student represents 3%. I think we had 10 students at the, at the high school of over 1,600. I think there have only been 10 students suspended. Um, of those, I, my recollection is that um, Four students were African American. About 44 per student, 44% of the students who've been suspended of the 32 um, are white students. Um, so there's a little bit of that slight disproportionality, um, but not as extreme as what you were talking about with an Asian woman. Nothing, nothing like that. And the numbers are small, and I'm happy to share that. I'm happy to sit down with people and go over those um, so that you can kind of see the, the sorts of things for which we would be suspending students. And, um, if you don't mind, can I just say another word and sort of and, and wrap up a little bit? Because um, this is this has been wonderful for us, and and um, the Princeton Public Schools we're a, we're a human institution, and like all human institutions, we're we're not perfect, um, but we're trying to get better. And as as a part of that process, we've looked really hard at these issues of of race and racial literacy and um, cultural competence and responsiveness and uh, we, we brought in um, an outside consultant this year to do a, 
an audit with us of, of our um, an equity audit to see how we were doing, to look at our data, to talk to our students, to talk to our families, to talk to our staff. Um, we engaged in um, very focused professional development with our with our teachers on the subject of implicit bias um, about race and looking at ourselves and our own implicit bias, looking at the impact that that has those glasses, as you were saying, in terms of how we we may view our students or our colleagues. And the um, it's interesting. I'm reminded as I look at everyone tonight. The the, the consultant who came in and, and worked with us said to me, she said, Steve, you know, you you can't. You can't read your way out of implicit bias. You can't workshop your way out of implicit bias. You can only relationship your way out of implicit bias. And so, um, one, for me to see the diversity of the people who were in this room and the commitment of the people who were in this room to this kind of work is very encouraging. Um, and I hope that, that we continue to, to foster those relationships. Um, I want to speak to, to your comment, uh, ma'am, about, um, about hiring because her, the, the notion of relationship being our way out of bias and into caring relationships with one another across cultures really brought to mind the need that we do need to have um, teachers and staff and administrators of color who are present in this district and connecting with each other as colleagues and connecting with our students. And so um, a year ago when I was asked to, to address the question of um, what are you doing about increasing the number of educators of color in the Princeton Public Schools, I really didn't have a very good answer. Um, and I didn't like that. And so we, we made a commitment this year to, to actively recruit really quality people. I spent um, the day before spring break, um, March 29th, at uh, Howard University all day um, talking to, to um, students. We've had our, our Director of Human Resources spend an entire week visiting 10 colleges throughout the South to try and develop a relationship with those institutions, a long-term relationship, that will start to, to create a, a, a pipeline of people who will think about the Princeton Public Schools. And I'm happy to say that this year, of the 85 new hires in the past year, 44% were educators of color. Of those, I believe 35 were, were teachers, counselors, um, professionals in our district, 44% were, were at professionals of color. Um, so it's a, it's a beginning, and we are, we're, we are making progress, and of course it's all about the retention of those people too, um, and the continuing um, training for all of us. So in terms of you know, next steps, we're waiting for the equity report to come from the consultant, but we're already planning for training this summer for uh, equity coaches. Uh, teachers, our own staff, to be coaches within each building. So we're trying to build capacity within each of our buildings. People who are knowledge about, knowledgeable about implicit bias, cultural competency, who can be supports for their colleagues as we move through this work. And the presentation tonight, this restorative justice presentation, is I, I'm here to learn as well. This is, it was wonderful to, to hear what you had to share and to be inspired by the, the, the um, implementation in other places around this country and to see the potential for what we can do as we gather our students, our teachers together in a circle of um, sharing and of trust and, and um, are all committed together to, um, to bridging this gap and to, to creating a better um, sense of belonging for every single member of the Princeton Public Schools. So um, I really want to thank all of you for being here and I, I want to thank Dr. Gregory for her comments and her inspiration. Um, and I hope that we can all move forward together and, and continue the good work. So thank you.
like, even like with a power truck, if you're like on the I'm like, you know what, McDonald's like, I've never found a time when like, it's been like, long with like, something so serious, and you feel very strong, and you know, like, I live with both. Yeah, I think it makes sense to give a shit. So you're teaching them? You're like helping? Well, so I observe most of the time and like I assist them too sometimes. So are you like independent? You're like studying undergrad? My advisor. Is it like an English thing or do you want to become a teacher at some point? I want to become a teacher, but this is like something for ELA teacher. 